Today, I'm going to give you 10 gigantic, incredibly important, mandatory tips that you must fully understand if you want to have success at cash games. Let's get right to it. Tip number one is to stop open limping. If you open limp on a regular basis in cash games, especially if they take a rake out of each pot, you will lose. Okay? Simple as that. An open limp, just to be clear, is whenever you are the first person to voluntarily put money in the pot. So if they deal the cards, small blinds in there, big blinds in there, you're under the gun, you're first to act. If you match the big blind, you're going to lose a poker. Okay? Stop doing that. Understand that many of your opponents are going to do exactly that, and that is why they are stuck in the small or medium stakes games. You simply cannot allow all the other players to see the flop or only one big blind. They're not making a mistake. They should call one big blind very often at that point and play in position against you with anything decent. Also, you let the big blind see the flop for free. Say they have the jack four off suit. If you raise, they have to fold. If you limp, sometimes they make three of a kind or jack high and that's good enough. And that's not what you want to have happen. So you need to raise. Also, whenever you limp, you induce people behind you to raise because they're going to think that you have a somewhat weak raise. And if they think you have a somewhat weak raise because they presume you would have raised with your best hands, well, they're going to raise you. Now you have to play out of position in a slightly larger pot than you would like to be in with what's probably not a very good hand. Also, like I said, by limping, assuming everyone limps behind, the casino is going to take a rake out of the pot. You do not want to pay rake to the casino. Rake is not your friend. Less rake is better, not more. So make sure you do not limp. Instead, simply raise. Whenever you're first to act in a live cash game and you want to raise, raise to something like three or four big blinds. I do not care if the standard raise in your game is to something like seven big blinds. Don't play poorly. Do not model your strategy after bad poker players who cannot move up from the small stakes games. Okay? You need to model your strategy after good, strong, winning poker players, and no good, strong, winning poker players open raising seven big blinds before the flop. So, raise first in. Tip number two is to raise with reasonable ranges. Many players play nowhere near reasonable ranges at all. So let me show you what I have right here. We have two different sets of ranges. We're going to go through a few positions in this scenario. Here we have under-the-gun ranges. This is when you are first to act at an eight-handed table, okay? In this chart, the hands in red are raising, the hands in blue are folding. Over here, hands in red are raising, hands in white are folding. The chart on this side, with blue, is a cash game chart with rake, and these charts do presume that everyone plays well. The chart on the right is actually for a tournament where there is no rake taken out of each pot, and there is an ante in play, which allows you to play wider ranges because the pot will be bigger if you raise when someone calls because there was an ante in play and no rake is taken out of the pot. So this is the game theory optimal range if everyone plays perfectly. Now look, your opponents will not play perfectly. Your opponents are going to make all sorts of mistakes. So for that reason, you can actually raise a little bit wider than this. But notice, like pocket twos is not raising. Ace 10 offsuit's not raising. 10-7 suit is not raising. They're nowhere near raising. And what a lot of people do very incorrectly is they think, all right, I'm going to mix it up. I have the 10-7 suited or the jack-4 offsuit. I'm going to mix it up and try to make my opponents confused. But no, 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 no. Make them confused when you have the king-5 suited or the king-jack offsuit or the 6-5 suited. You have way better spots to get, quote-unquote, out of line, right? And the reason I showed you the tournament charts here is that this is about as loose as you can possibly raise. Now, this chart does presume the opponents play well, but it also presumes the pot is going to be bigger than it actually is in your specific games. But you really can't get away with raising much wider than this range. If you told me you wanted to raise this range in a live cash game where everybody's making mistakes left and right, fine, I don't have a problem with it. But don't get much looser than this from under the gun. If you're on the button, you get to play many more hands. As you are in a better position, you get to raise wider and wider and wider right? Because there are fewer players yet to act who can randomly wake up with a hand. To be clear, these charts are for when everyone folds to you. If people limp in front of you or raise in front of you, you're going to need to use different charts. We have different charts available at pokercoaching.com in our app and on the website. Go check that out. As you see, though, in a cash game, you can raise with about 41% of hands, assuming the blinds play perfectly, which they will not, so you get to raise a little bit wider. And in a tournament with, again, no 
rake, and an ante, you get to play 55% of hands. A whole lot more, like 15% more hands, which is a lot. So, again, this is about as wide as you can reasonably raise, unless the players in the blinds are very tight and very passive. So, keep that in mind. Tip number three is to three bet often from the small blind. Paying the rake is really, 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 really bad. Consider what happens. If someone raises from, let's say, the button, you call from the small blind and the big blind folds. Say they made it three big blinds before the flop. The pot would normally be seven big blinds in a cash game, but a lot of casinos will take one big blind out of the pot, which is like 13% of the pot or something like that. My math may be wrong. Forgive me. So, do you want to give away 13-ish percent of the pot from out of position? Even 10% of the pot, which is like the minimum a lot of casinos take. The answer is definitely not. Also, a lot of casinos take money out for a bad beat jackpot, which no limit hold'em players don't hit all that often anyway. So this is really, really bad for you. If they're taking 15 or 20% of the pot, there is no way in the world you can win with all sorts of random stuff. So to account for this, you need to be re-raising, three betting, same word, or folding with every hand you plan to play. Here is the GTO small blind strategy against an under the gun raise. And you see, you're really only three betting just the absolute best hands plus a few suited connected bluffs. I know it seems tight. And you can probably raise a little bit wider than this or re-raise a little bit wider than this. But again, you can't get too insane. You can't be re-raising the ace nine offsuit or the queen nine suited or the pocket twos. It's not a good strategy. I want to make it crystal clear here. There is no calling range because when you call, you have a bad relative position because when you call, the big blind is going to call a lot on the flop. You're going to check. The big blind is going to check the initial raises you're going to bet. Then you have to figure out what you're going to do before the big blind announces if they have a good hand or not. So that's bad. And you're out of position against a strong range. So all of that forces you to be very, very tight. Over here, we have the small blind three betting strategy against the button. Now you do get to three bet substantially wider because the button is raising wider. Remember, we're presuming the button's raising with this range here, which is pretty wide, right? So that allows you to three bet much wider yourself. But again, you're not going nuts. You're not three betting every suited ace. You're not three betting ace and nine offsuit or pocket threes or eight, seven suited. These hands just go right into the muck. None of your opponents are going to do this. They're going to play far too loose. And you know what? They're all going to lose. If you make regular, consistent blunders, like a lot of your opponents will do in small and medium six games, you're going to get crushed. Tip number four. Three bet often versus a raise. Again, many players do not three bet often enough. Here we have a few charts. I know that it's a little bit small on your end. Here we have a low jack strategy, which would be under the gun if we were playing six-handed, versus a raise from under the gun, eight-handed. Here we have the hijack, which is the position to the left of the low jack, versus a low jack raise. And here we have button versus a cutoff raise. So you see these ranges get looser because the initial raiser and the uh, player yet to act are loose, are, are in later positions as we go this way. So let's take a look at uh, low jack versus under the gun. Notice, not a whole lot of calling. The hands that are calling are actually all really good. And for that reason, this is a spot where you got to play super tight because again, under the gun should have a very strong range, but also there are a lot of players yet to act who could easily wake up with a strong hand and put you in a miserable spot by three betting, right? You don't really want to call with jack nine suited and get three bet by somebody yet to act or four bet by the initial raiser. Then you just have to fold immediately, right? So we see a pretty good amount of three betting. Most players do not three bet the king 10 suited, the ace four suited, the ace eight suited, the king queen suited. Most people call or, or three bet king queen off suit, ace jack off suit, etc. And that's just a mistake. Here we have hijack versus a low jack raise. A pretty similar range because assuming your opponents are playing relatively tight strategies, because they should if there's a rake in the cash game, this is a spot where they just can't get out of line. And if they can't get out of line, you in turn can't get out of line. Now, look, again, you may want to play a little bit looser if your opponents are not going to format enough or if they're raising too wide. But you can't get too crazy. Maybe you three about a little bit more than this, or maybe you call a little bit more than this, but not much more. Here we have about as loose as you should be uh, button versus a cutoff raise. Notice again, lots of three betting with a polarized range, meaning you're three betting with your best hands, some suited aces, some suited kings, a few suited connectors, and some offsuit high cards that you don't really want to call, like ace 10 offsuit. And the calling range is entirely hands that flop pretty well. Some suited aces, good suited Broadway hands, some suited connectors, some pairs and some very good high cards that you don't want to 3-bet and then get 4-bet with, like Ace-Queen. You don't really want to 3-bet Ace-Queen and then get 4-bet. But in most games, if you'll find that all of your opponents are 3-betting the Ace-Queen offsuit every single time. They think it's the nuts, they 3-bet it, they get 4-bet, and then they don't know what to do, and then they lose a ton of money, and that's one more reason why they lose. 
Tip number five. We're talking about post flop now. Consider range and nut advantage. Each flop will favor one player or the other. And if you have the range advantage, you should be betting more often. So what is the range advantage? That means that if you took your entire range, whatever that was before the flop, and you ran that in a equity calculator against your opponent's entire range, one player is going to have more equity than the other. We'll go through this in just a second. Next, one player will have the nut advantage more than the others, meaning they just have far more super strong hands they can put the money in. If you have the range advantage, you're going to find that you should usually bet very often, sometimes 100% of the time. And if you have more nut hands, you should usually use larger bet sizes because when you have a lot of strong hands in your range, you typically want to put money in the pot. So let's consider what happens when you raise from the low jack and the big blind calls. That's it. You raise the low jack, the big blind calls. You may ask, what is my hand? You have your entire range at this point. We don't know what your hand is. It doesn't even matter. So you raise low jack, big blind calls, flop comes ace, jack, nine. Just think about this logically. If low jack is raising with a very strong pre-flop raising range, they're going to have pocket aces, pocket jacks, pocket nines, ace jack, ace nine suited, ace king, ace queen, etc. right? They have a lot of really good hands. But if the big blind, which we haven't even discussed here, make sure you check out pokercoaching.com in the charts there where we discuss that thoroughly. If they're going to be three betting hands like ace king, ace queen, pocket jacks, pocket aces, etc., they don't have those hands. This is a spot where the initial raiser has a big range advantage and a big nut advantage, which is going to lead to very frequent betting, probably 100% of the time, and also some large bets in this spot. Consider 633. This is another scenario where the initial raiser will have a big range advantage because they have all the overpairs and the big blinds have all sorts of trash on 633. So that means the initial raiser can bet very frequently. However, on 633, the initial raiser has almost no threes in their range at all. So even though they have the range advantage, they lack the nut advantage. And that results in the initial raiser betting very frequently, perhaps 100% of the time, but using a small size, okay? And a small size is like one big blind or two big blinds. May sound crazy, but that is good, strong poker. Consider 875 with a flush draw. This is a spot where now the initial raiser should not be betting very often because the initial raiser does not have a whole lot of hands that connect all that well with this board. They don't have the 9-6 suited. They may not even have the 8-7 suited if they're playing nitty. And I mean, they just don't have a lot of good hands here, right? So this is a board where the... Big blind is going to have not necessarily a, an advantage, but it's way closer to 50-50, right? And when it's closer to 50-50, that forces the initial raiser to continuation bet far less often. You know what? While we're talking about this, I actually wrote a book. It just came out. It's called 100 Essential Tips to Master No Limit Hold'em. We're going through 10 today, not necessarily from this book. But look, this book explains all sorts of things you must master. For example, properly combat limpers. Most people combat limpers incorrectly. What else do we have? Consider who has the nut advantage. We literally just talked about that. Who is hot in this office? Can you imagine me sitting in this office grinding all day every day for you? Bet when check two on the turn. Most people check far too weak. Overfold against most players' aggression on the river. Oh my God, we're about to talk about that in just a second. Anyway, you can check out this book. If you like this video, if you're enjoying this, if you like my content, you're going to love this book. We'll put links below. You can get it on Amazon or DB Poker or lots of other places. Tip number six is to stop slow playing. Understand that you want to play big pots with your best hands and small and medium-sized pots with everything else. Whenever you have a big edge, you want to get a lot of money in the pot. When you don't have a big edge, you don't really want to get a lot of money in the pot unless you have a good logical bluffing hand. So when you have one of your best hands, try to get money in the pot. As the pre-flop aggressor, if you raise pre-flop and somebody called and you flop a really good hand, if they check, bet. And perhaps exploitatively, Use a larger size than normal, not a humongous size, but you know, if you know that sometimes you want to bet pot, bet pot with your best hands, even though it may not be the game theory optimal strategy. Whenever you are the pre-flop caller facing a bet, say the cutoff raises and you call on the button and you flop a good hand, if they bet the flop, raise. If you're in the big blind, you check the flop, they bet, raise. Put money in the pot with your best hands, please. The only time slow playing may make some sense is when all of the following are true. First, the board, board is extremely uncoordinated. That's going to be a flop like jack, six, two. Pretty uncoordinated board. Next, 
when your opponent can make many hands or can have many hands that could improve to the second best hand on the next card. On Jack 6 2, your opponent could easily have a hand like Ace King, Ace Queen, King Queen that can make top pair. Spot where, you know, if you can beat those hands, that's a good scenario to slow play. A time you do not want to slow play is when the hands that your opponent can reasonably improve to beat you. Give an example. Say you raise Ace King before the flop and the big blind calls, the flop comes, whatever, Ace something something. If they check and you check it back, what is going to improve that will also want to put in a ton of money? on ace, nine, two. Well, it's going to be the straight draws, like five, four, five, three, four, three. If they improve, you lose. It's going to be pocket sixes when it spikes a six. It's going to be nine, eight when it turns trips or two pair, but it's not going to be a hand like queen jack that makes a random jack, right? That's a really bad spot to slow play. Next, you also want to keep slow playing, or you want to, con you want to be consider slow playing when your opponent will keep betting on many turns. If you think your opponent's just going to blast a turn very frequently because that's how they operate, it's a pretty good spot to slow play. And finally, you want to slow play when you block many of the hands that are of high value that your opponent could have. Usually this is going to be when you have top set, top three of a kind in particular, because when you do have that hand, it's really hard for your opponent to have anything. Consider on jack 6-2, and if you have pocket jacks, it's really hard for your opponent to have anything that could potentially put a lot of money in the pot, right? And if they do have three of a kind, like say they have pocket twos on jack six two, you're going to play a big pot anyway, right? So that's a spot where maybe it makes sense to slow play. Long story short, top set on an uncoordinated board, sure, feel free to slow play. Anything else, don't slow play, bet and get money in the pot. Tip number seven is to play cautiously in multi-way pots. I cannot tell you how many times I have seen players flop top pair in a multi-way pot, 100 big blinds deep. And then just plow their money in because top pair, even with top kickers, normally pretty good. But not when you're playing against six other people and three of them want to put all their money in the pot. You are going to be dead. When a lot of players see the flop, someone is likely to have something. And that becomes more and more and more true as more and more players see the flop. If it is not you, well, it's probably someone else. This forces you to play extremely cautiously in multi way pots across the board. So, from out of position, you have to do a lot of checking. Very often, you have to check every single hand in your range. As a general rule, if the flop comes three cards, 10 or lower that are kind of connected, and you were an early position raiser and a bunch of people called you, you should be checking everything because that board should completely hit all of your opponent's ranges. Also, you just don't need to bluff all that often with low equity hands in multi-way pots. If you have just two over cards in a multi-way pot, you probably don't want to be bluffing it. Whereas in a heads-up pot, sure, go ahead and bet, right? So from out of position, you have to do a lot of checking. The only time you really get to be kind of aggressive in multi-way pots as the initial better on the flop is when everyone checks to you and you have a hand that's probably good but vulnerable. There you should be betting very frequently. This is going to be with hands like top pair or maybe even a, an under pair. Like say someone raises, someone calls, someone calls, you call with pocket eights on the button. And the flop comes nine, six, three, and they all check to you. This is a spot where making a bet is usually fine. When you do bet in multi-way pots, you usually want to use a relatively small size because you do not have much of a nut advantage because no one can have much of a nut advantage. Remember how we discussed that earlier? If you have a big nut advantage, you bet big in general, but no one really has a nut advantage because all of your ranges are all on top of each other. So be very, very careful in multi-way pots. Don't stack off too lightly. Tip number eight is to exploitatively overfold to large river bets. Most players in most games absolutely hate getting stacked. They do not want to lose all of their money. So many people come to me and they are distraught that they lost just like a super standard setup hand in my mind. They're like, oh, can I have found a fold? Or, oh, did I have to bluff it off? But look, you're going to get stacked sometimes. Get used to it. Anyway, most people hate getting stacked. So because of that, when most players want to put all their money in the pot, they usually have a pretty good hand, usually a very good hand. Also, most players hate getting caught bluff, getting caught bluffing, because it makes them feel stupid. If some people feel bad, whatever, they bluff with nothing, they get called and they either have to muck or they have to show their bluff. Either one, they don't like it. In reality, you should be proud of your bluffs. Table them confidently. Every once in a while, they'll give you the pot. You'd be shocked. So, because of this, because most people hate getting caught bluffing, 
almost no one bluffs often enough. So people usually are very value heavy with really good hands when they're betting big on the river and they don't bluff enough. So these things combined to mean you should exploitatively overfold. If you have top pair of the marginal kicker and someone bets the flop and bets the turn and bets the river and they're kind of tight and kind of straightforward, fold, you're done. Get out of the hand. It is okay. Realize that that line does not happen where it goes bet, bet, big bet all that often. Now, if your opponent is a loose, aggressive, insane maniac, then sure, maybe because they're finding hero calls. But if your opponent's kind of tight, kind of cautious, kind of straightforward, own a lot, own a lot. Owning's not fun, I realize that I hate folding, but uh, <laughs> sometimes you gotta do it. Step number nine is to keep a proper bankroll. You will inevitably have large upswings and large downswings. You have to recognize this, accept this, and plan ahead. Even if you have a huge win rate, you should keep at least 3,000 big blinds in your bankroll. Say you're playing one to no limit. $2 times 3,000 is $6,000. Yeah, you need about $6,000 to play one to no limit. And if you want to be cautious, you should keep a whole lot more, like 7,500, or maybe even more. If you're playing tough online games against decently strong players and you're winning three big blinds per 100 hands, you're going to need a ton of big blinds, because you're going to inevitably have big, big swings, especially as your edge gets smaller and smaller. And unfortunately for you, if you're playing small stakes games, the rake in most games is kind of big. And because of that, having a large edge is not actually all that reasonable. Maybe at 1-2, you can win at most $15 per hour or $10 per hour. And if that's the case, you are going to need a decent amount of big blinds because your downswings are going to be savage. And tip number 10 is to stay sane. Like I just said, you will have large upswings and downswings. Get used to it, accept it, understand it. Don't let it bother you. Don't get too happy when you win a bunch of money, because sometimes you will. Don't get too sad when you lose a bunch of money, because sometimes you will. These are standard things that will happen. Coaching a student right now, and he just went on a massive upswing. He won like 60,000 bucks in one month from cash games and tournaments. And then he promptly lost about $6,000 playing cash games over a weekend. And he was distraught. How could this possibly happen? He was happy when he won. He's sad when he lost. He's going through all the mental swings. He's playing poorly when he's losing. He's probably playing fine when he's winning, or maybe he's just getting lucky. Who knows? And you got to grow up. You have to realize this stuff is normal. Understand that real poker is not a YouTube video blog where we're trying to sensationalize everything. You can't be, oh, I got it in with aces against kings. The flop comes nine, six, three, four, two. No, no, my life is ruined. Click the like button and the subscribe button. That's not what real poker is. Instead, I got on my money. I lost. Let's play another hand. Your job at the poker table is to simply make the best decision at every decision point. If you make better decisions than your opponents, in the long run, you will win. Realize that volume cures variance. If you put your seat in the chair, and you play a lot with an edge, you will win. To win at poker, it really is simple. No one likes it that it's this simple. They want to try to make it sound overly complicated. But it is this simple. Find a game you can beat, either because your opponents are awful or because you're amazing and your opponents are slightly less amazing. Either one doesn't really matter. Next, play that game a lot. The tough thing about finding really bad players to play with is that usually they quit kind of fast because they realize they're really bad. So usually you have to get pretty good. I have a poker training site, pokercoaching.com, that might help you with that. So find a game you can beat, play it a lot, and keep a proper bankroll. If you do those three things, you will win. If you do two of these three things, maybe you'll win. If you do one or zero, you're going to lose, period. But yeah, find a game you can beat. Step number one, get good at poker. If you want to get better at poker, right now immediately, 100 essential tips to master no limit hold'em by me. Check it out on Amazon and D&B Poker. That's going to be it for today. I hope you enjoyed these 10 tips that you must master to crush live cash games. Good luck in your games. Have fun. Click the like and subscribe button down below. Click the notification bell. And if you have tip number 11 that you think I should share next time, or you just want people down below to know it so that they don't screw up and spot it. Maybe you screwed up in the past. Type it down there. We all appreciate it. Good luck. Have fun. We hope you win all the money in the cash games.